Hi, welcome to Mechanical PE Exam Prep Question of the Week, the series where I solve mechanical engineering problems for aspiring professional engineers. In today's video, we have a fairly in-depth heat transfer problem that hits multiple core concepts. We'll be finding the heat loss from an uninsulated steam pipe. Let's get started. Heat loss from an uninsulated steam pipe. An uninsulated horizontal pipe with 4 inch outside diameter carries saturated 300 PSIA steam through a 70 degree room. The steam flow rate is 5,000 pounds per hour. The pipe emissivity is 0.8. Approximately what decrease in quality will occur in the first 50 feet of length? So let's sketch this out. We have this pipe. We know the mass flow rate of steam. Let's assume the flow is left to right. And we've been told that the steam is saturated and it's 300 PSIA. The words saturated steam mean that initially the quality is one. Otherwise, they would have to say it's a saturated mixture. We know the steam is going to cool slightly and become a saturated mixture, but we don't know how much the final quality is going to decrease by, and that's what we're looking to find out. We know the outside diameter of the pipe is four inches, and we only care about the heat loss in the first 50 feet of length. We know the ambient temperature of the room is 70 degrees. And we've been given the emissivity of the pipe, which is an important clue that the heat loss may be driven not only by convection, but also by radiation. We know there's no conduction since the pipe is not in direct contact with anything other than the surrounding air. Since this problem is fairly involved, let's make sure we have a clear game plan before we dive too deep into the details so we don't get lost. Here's our sketch of the pipe again. And I want to remind you about what's actually happening to the steam on the vapor dome as shown on a temperature volume diagram. As you can see, we have three regions, the liquid region to the left, the saturated region in the middle, and the superheated region on the right. This blue dot shows our starting point, saturated steam. This is the boundary between the saturated region and the superheated region. It's on the saturation curve. 100% of the steam is in vapor form, and the quality is said to be one. As the steam travels in the uninsulated pipe in a 70 degree room, it will be cooled and moved to the left, changing from a vapor to a liquid at constant temperature. As steam condenses, it undergoes phase change at constant temperature. That's very important because the temperature inside the pipe is constant. If it weren't constant, this question gets considerably more complex because then there would be a temperature gradient along the length of the pipe. So the next thing we want to do is look up saturated steam in the steam table at the stated pressure, 300 PSI, and see what the temperature actually is. It turns out to be 417.35 degrees. Let's also make note of the latent heat of vaporization for steam at 300 PSI. It's 809.4 BTU per pound. This is the total amount of heat that would be released per unit mass if the steam were to fully condense and change to 100% liquid, in other words, a quality of zero. We will assume it stops far short since we're only dealing with 50 feet of length and the steam is much hotter than the room. Chances are the quality will only decrease slightly, but let's see if that's true. So how are we actually going to quantify the decrease in quality? Well, if we can find out how much the enthalpy changes from where it enters the pipe to when it leaves, we can set up a ratio of that delta H compared to the 809.4 BTU per pound, which is the latent heat of vaporization for steam at 300 PSI. Note in the steam table, the difference between HF, enthalpy for a saturated liquid, and HG, enthalpy for a saturated vapor, is HFG, the latent heat of vaporization. So delta H is how much heat is actually lost, and HFG is how much could be lost if the quality were, were driven all the way to zero, if you were to go all the way from a saturated vapor to a saturated liquid. So we have HFG, but then to find delta H, we can use Q dot equals M dot delta H. We already know the mass flow rate, but we don't know Q dot, which is the total amount of heat lost in the first 50 feet. And there are two modes of heat transfer contributing to the total heat loss, convection and radiation, which we will calculate separately. And that's really the thrust of this problem, is working out the heat loss from radiation and the heat loss from convection, after which we'll return to these equations and put it all together. 
Let's look at the heat loss from radiation first. The version of the radiation formula that probably comes to mind quickly is Q dot equals sigma times area times the difference of temperatures to the fourth power. And that's true for the most simplistic radiation problems. But here we need this slightly more generalized version formed by combining equations 3716 and 3717. Sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann constant. Fa is the arrangement factor, which can be looked up in table 371. It says, for a completely enclosed body, which is small compared with the enclosure, it's appropriate to assume the arrangement factor is 1. Here, the pipe is the body enclosed in the room to which it is comparatively small. Fe is the emissivity factor, which in the most complex cases depends on both bodies since radiation can happen in both directions. But again, for this geometry, only the emissivity of the pipe is relevant, so we can set Fe equal to the pipe's emissivity that we were given in the problem statement, which is 0.8. A is the area, but what area? Well, it's the surface area of the pipe, which is radiating heat to the environment. So the surface area of a cylinder is the circumference of the pipe, or pi times diameter, times the length, so pi dl. Then for the temperatures, we have to remember to use absolute temperatures. The reminder for this is in the units of the Stefan Boltzmann constant, you'll notice that it carries Rankine rather than Fahrenheit. So using Fahrenheit instead of Rankine is a common mistake, and you really need to be careful there. So let's plug it in. 0.1713 times 10 to the negative 8 is the value for the Stefan Boltzmann constant in US customary units. Also note T1 is the temperature of the outside of the pipe, which we assume to be the same as the steam itself, 417.35 degrees Fahrenheit plus 460 to go from Fahrenheit to Rankine. And T ambient is the 70 degrees, again plus 460, so 530 Rankine. Crunching the numbers and canceling the units, we get 36,850 BTUs per hour. So that is the heat loss from radiation. Now for the heat loss from convection, I'm going to try not to go too far down the heat transfer rabbit holes here. So bear with me as I really want to focus on what you need to solve the problem. The convection heat transfer equation you probably have memorized is Q dot equals HA delta T. The challenge of convection problems is figuring out what to use for H, which is the film coefficient. The process becomes about making a series of simplifying assumptions that allow you to categorize the problem and to choose the formula that will allow you to correctly specify H. Here we are going to refer to table 35.3 natural convection film coefficients since there's no forced convection. This table gives us simplified equations for natural convection in air when at normal atmospheric pressure, which is the case here, and the surface is isothermal or constant temperature, which is the case for our pipe since the steam is condensing at constant temperature. Latent cooling, not sensible. Just getting to this point is not trivial. From there, there are two equations in the table to choose from, one which gets the diameter involved and the other which does not. We're fine either way since we have the diameter. But the criteria for choosing between the two formulas is based on the product of two dimensionless numbers, one called the Prandtl number and the other called the Grashof number. By the way, the product of these two is called the Rayleigh number, which is not particularly important here, but I want to mention it in case you come across that term in other problems, you will at least have heard it before. Anyway, let's take these one at a time. If we jump to app 35C, Properties of Atmospheric Air, we can actually look up the Prandtl number from a table since it's a function of the fluid only and basically varies slightly only with temperature. Technically, the Prandtl number is defined as the ratio of momentum diffusion to thermal diffusion, but I can't claim to fully understand the implications of that definition. What I did get from reading the MERM is that it's a function of the specific heat capacity, viscosity, and conductivity, all of which are properties of air at a given temperature, hence why the Prandtl number can be pulled right from a table. The key is selecting the proper value based on the film temperature, and this is another common mistake if you use the ambient air temperature or the temperature of the outside of the pipe. That's not really the film temperature that we want to use. We want the temperature of air at the boundary of the convection process near the pipe. And as an approximation, 
we can take the average of the pipe surface temperature and the ambient air temperature. That gives us a film temperature of about 243 degrees. If you're following along with the table, you will notice the Prandtl number does not change very much with temperature in this range. And since values are given for 200 and 300 degrees, we can do a rough interpolation and conclude that the Prandtl number is about 0.715. Remember, we're only trying to figure out which range we end up in to select the correct formula to find the film coefficient. So you have to get comfortable making some loose assumptions. Now, while we're in the same table, we should also take the value for this ratio, g times beta times rho squared over mu squared, because we're going to need it when we find the Grashof number next. g is gravity, beta is the coefficient of volumetric thermal expansion, rho is density, and mu is viscosity. They've given us this number in the table for convenience. You could obviously look up all four of these parameters separately, but it's a lot of multiplication, a lot to keep track of. So they've put them right in the table to make our lives easier. And I'm taking the average of the values at 200 and 300 degrees because 250 is close enough to our film temperature, which is 243. So for our purposes, we can again be a bit rough here in our interpolation. And that works out to 0.647 times 10 to the sixth. And the units are one over cubic feet and degrees Fahrenheit. Now we plug that into equation 35.4 to compute the Grashof number. The Grashof number is defined as the ratio of buoyant to viscous forces. Again, we should probably go deeper on the underlying heat transfer theory there, but for now, the Grashof number is a means to an end. We're trying to find this product so we can choose the right formula for the film coefficient. Note that based on table 35.2, the diameter should be used for L in this formula for a horizontal cylinder. Plugging in the values, we get 8.3 times 10 to the sixth. And again, this is a dimensionless number. The product of the Prandtl and Grashof numbers works out to 5.9 times 10 to the sixth. And that means we're using the first equation for the film coefficient since we are in the corresponding range. We can plug in for the temperatures and diameter, all of which are known, and we get a film coefficient of about one and a half BTU per hour foot squared degrees F. And finally, we can find the heat loss from convection, which is the one and a half times the area, which as before is the surface area of the pipe, pi dl, and all of that times the delta t. And we get a heat loss of 27,900 BTUs per hour, which is actually a bit less than the radiation heat loss, but both are similar contributions. To put it all together, according to our original game plan, we can add the heat loss from convection and radiation, that's nearly 37,000 BTUs per hour for the convection and nearly 28,000 BTUs per hour for the radiation for a total heat loss of some 64,000 BTUs per hour. Now we want to know how much that heat loss actually changed the enthalpy of the steam. To determine that, we write Q dot equals M dot delta H and rearrange that for delta H, then substitute the total heat loss and mass flow rate and we get 12.95 BTU per pound as the change in enthalpy in the first 50 feet of pipe. Now the change in quality is the change in enthalpy as a fraction of the maximum enthalpy change that would be required to drive the quality all the way to zero, which is the latent heat of vaporization, HFG. Earlier we said that was 809 BTUs per pound. And as it turns out, that's only a 1.6% decrease in quality. And that's our final answer. In summary, the main takeaways from this problem were one, recognizing which modes of heat transfer are in play. Convection was obvious, but radiation was less obvious and also made a significant contribution to the total heat loss. And two, classifying the convection as natural convection and subclassifying based on the range of the product of the Prandtl and Grashof numbers to select the appropriate simplified equation for finding the film coefficient h. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed this problem. In the coming weeks, I'm planning to solve more problems about using the sensible heat protractor, finding the efficiency of a turbine, specifying the overall coefficient of heat transfer, and more. If you're a mechanical engineer studying for the P exam and you would like to submit a question, the best way is to send me an email at dan at mechanicalpeexamprep.com. And if you want to make your study process as efficient as possible, sign up for my courses if you haven't already. Tons of candidates are using these courses to make sure they get the fundamentals first 
and then continuing with lots of practice problems. It's a great way to give direction and clarity to your preparation and take your studying to the next level. Use the link below and coupon code MEC10 to get 10% off. Until next week, happy studying.